the like besides running industry tied business analytic courses in four centers. His academic credentials include PhD from Washington University, USA, MPhil in Environmental Economics, Madras University, a master's degree in Sociology, Public Administration, and a fellowship in Advanced Marketing from International Institute of Advanced Marketing. LLB, LLB from Mumbai University, and MBA from University of Calicut. We welcome you, sir, and I hope we have a wonderful session uh, with PME. Thank you for our... Thank you, uh, uh, Chandrasekhar sir. We cannot be a much better person life than other than Chandrasekhar sir. So uh, thank you for uh, you know accepting our invitation, coming to this particular thing as a moderator. So uh, we are, we are. I am honored. I am honored. I am just standing over the session to you, sir. So thank please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I profusely appreciate the management of this great institution, PMA, a part of IMA to bestow the responsibility on me for anchoring this program, especially being a moderator. Thank you very much. I really appreciate. I was just going through the topic, crossing the chasm in challenging times. I just want to take only two minutes before I step into the speaker. There was an article in 1991 uh, by Jeffrey Moore, same word, crossing the chasm in difficult times. The only thing is the context is different. The context was how the marketing companies take a different approach towards marketing and get into what is called a big market, starting from a small market to a big market. After 40, 30 years, the same topic has come to the dais, and that is the meat of our discussion today. But the question is, the situation has changed. The chasm created is something external, and the people affected are every one of you, like you and me. And this chasm has created a lot of challenges, and that is the topic. And we have at the moment, a person, nobody other than having a condensed wisdom of 50 years as a bureaucrat, as a head of the financial institution, as a person to whom always challenging assignments are given. I understand he undertook UTI when UTI was in danger. He came to IDBA when IDBA was in danger. He came to SEBI when SEBI was in danger. There could not be a better person than Mr. Damodaran who can address this title. How do you handle things in a challenging time? Normal time, normal wisdom, normal people will do. But in a challenging time, when there is a, a chase, when there is a crossing the chasm, you need something extraordinary. And this is what, sir, we look forward from you, sir. The dice is yours, and please try to address us. How do we understand the chasm? How do we understand the challenges? And how do we protect ourselves? And how do we prepare ourselves towards a better tomorrow? Sir, the dice is yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Menon. And let me thank the uh, PMA for giving me the privilege and the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you. As I mentioned in informal conversation before we got started, Palakkad is my home district and there is no way that I would have said no. I didn't need any persuasion from Vinita or anybody else. So as soon as I got the first call, I said, okay, I will uh, move my engagements in the calendar around to keep a slot. Thank you. Yeah, because in COVID times, as we recognize, all of us are busier than we were in the pre-COVID times. Many people think that we don't spend time traveling and therefore that time can also be utilized for meetings. So today I am dressed as I am. I would have been in a half sleeve shirt only because I'm coming out of another meeting and into this. So uh, that is how busy one has been kept in COVID times. Uh, it, it is a privilege really to, to be with members of an organization with past presidents who have built it 
to a level in which it has won LMA awards at the All India level. And uh, as uh, the president said, the 36th event in a difficult year, that itself is an achievement. You don't even have to go into the kind of events that are organized to think that you can actually conduct 36 events when the last quarter of the financial year, I call it the lost quarter, we lost that quarter, nothing really happened uh, in that quarter. And the, the immediate uh, first quarter of the uh, current financial year again is a lost quarter in terms of what was possible, what could have happened and what did not happen. But I will park those thoughts because I am an incorrigible optimist. I think that uh, it is, it's of course, a cliche, but it is worth repeating that in every crisis, there resides a great opportunity. And if COVID has posed problems, if it is continuing to pose problems, uh, if it is making life seem more difficult, it's also leaving us with a lot of things that we can take advantage of. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Menon, that uh, Normal people will find it difficult to cross the chasm. I beg to differ. Normal people in normal times do not exhaust the reserves of their imagination, their energy, their enthusiasm, their excitement in order to cross the obstacles that lie ahead. But in difficult times, all of us challenge ourselves that much more. And I also looked at why the word chasm was used because literally chasm means a physical crack, a fissure on the surface of the earth. That somewhere there is a crack. Now how does one cross that chasm? To cross that chasm you must have, and now I'm moving away from the physical concept of the chasm but still retaining its ingredients so that I can explain my thoughts. To cross that you need to have the confidence that you can cross it. You need to have the courage that you can cross it. You need to have the conviction that you can cross it. You need to have faith in your own abilities. You need to be uh, sure that you will get across this and land on the other side. And into that effort, you must put in all the energy that you can summon. You must put in that uncompromising attitude that you need at this time to say that I have what it takes in me to get across that. Because post my superannuation, I have been interacting with a very large number of people, not just in the board positions that I hold, but uh, in, in uh, educational institutions, in schools in the neighborhood, talking to young people. And I discover that the one problem that we have is that we are nowhere near our potential in terms of how we perform. So the journey from our present level of performance to what our potential will enable us to perform if we move in that direction <coughs> is the one challenge that both individuals and institutions should set for themselves. Now to do this, to cross the chasm as it were, it's also important that some of the things that we uh, believed to be obstacles, hurdles, we look around, we find people that uh, are not in agreement with us. Uh, we spend a lot of time and bandwidth trying to persuade those that cannot be persuaded. So I think the difficult decisions of whom to carry with you on this journey and whom you will not invest time on because he or she is unwilling and unable to understand what you are embarked on. That difficult decision will have to be taken. When you look at organizations, for example, in COVID times, there are some organizations that are looking inwards, looking at the here and now, looking at what you need to fix now, looking at downsizing, at truncating operations, looking at shutting shop in some places. But they are taking their eye off the ball as far as identifying the opportunities that lie ahead of us. Because if you start with the assumption that there is a post-COVID world, the world is not going to go away with COVID. I was reading somewhere that on the 21st of June, the world will come to an end. And I had some important commitments on 23rd. So in a lighter vein, I reached out to that person and I said, 
is it okay if I confirm on 22nd morning, assuming you and I and the, I and the earth are going to be around? We had a good laugh about that. So there are people, there are Cassandras, there are people who are waiting to write the obituary of the earth. It won't happen. The earth is a, a strong uh, uh, physical entity with all of us on it, and I don't think we will allow that to happen. So to look at what lies ahead when COVID finally decides either to go away or to remain one of the inconvenient permanent factors in our lives, which won't bother us too much, but will occasionally set us back, not take away our lives. Into that world, if an individual is to move, if a company is to move, this is the time really to build on your strengths, to reinforce your strengths, to look at what opportunities lie ahead and to prepare yourself for the opportunities because I believe in the motto of the Boy Scouts. That is the best motto there has ever been, the shortest and the best. It says, be prepared. So if you are not prepared, you will then be playing black pieces in the game of life. Somebody else will make the first move and you will be responding. You will be reacting to it. But if you are playing the white pieces, you need to anticipate, you need to be prepared. You need to summon both the internal resources as well as identifying the external resources. Those, I think, are some of the things that going forward we need to do to bridge the chasm. And what I would recommend to everybody, including and especially to young people, is this. That some of us have made some mistakes. Our generation has made mistakes. We have perhaps left the earth a little worse than what we inherited. And therefore, we are not giving them the best inheritance in terms of uh, the climatic changes that our own actions have brought into effect in terms of knocking off all the trees, in terms of polluting the water sources and all of that. So they have a challenge because of the problems that we created, but they also have, and I believe the energy and the enthusiasm and the excitement of youth will conquer everything that there is, plus the impatience of youth. I think youth must be impatient. If youth is patient, it is not youth any longer. Impatience belongs, patience belongs to an older generation. You must be impatient. And, and sometimes when I say this, I do get criticized, but I will nevertheless say it. It must be irreverent. I don't think reverence is something that you need to inform the relationships between individuals. Respect certainly is important. But the minute you get reverential, you're suspending judgment and substituting somebody else's judgment for yours, which is not the best way to conduct your own affairs. So those are some of the things that I thought uh, I will state up front in this conversation with you, Dr. Great, great. Interesting. Very interesting. And you have made it in a very short and simple <coughs> way. And in a nutshell, what as an audience, all of us, we understand from your last few minutes talk is that uh, now and hereafter, one has to be agile. Yes. One should not think about negativity. We should move forward. And uh, as you rightly said, whatever you want to hold, hold. Whatever you want to drop, drop and move forward. There is no point in wasting time on something you hold uh, for a long time without any purpose and without any meaning. Excellent. And you should look for more opportunities than the threat. Excellent, sir. I cannot ask anything better. Okay. So therefore, we are coming to a consensus at this level that agility is the first part of reaction, what we can do to cross the, uh, the, the link or the cross the crack. Uh, are we on the same page? If this is the case, uh, taking threat from your earlier discussion, faith, confidence, positive thinking, all that should help. So finally, along with these positive factors and your willingness to become agile, and if you are adaptable to the new opportunities, probably uh, our speaker says we are willing to cross the break and we can reach towards the shore in a safe way. So being this, as the architecture of our moving to the next level, crossing this break, crossing the crack. We in Palgat 
we have certain questions to place in front of you and these questions are highly relevant to the palgad management association then it is universal one of such question in our mind lingering in our mind is we have set a vision document called vision 2025 sir in that document we have envisaged palga to be groomed as a center for startup and industries or perhaps taking threat from the old knowledge about palga a place for agriculture and tourism or a place for infrastructure or education considering your past experience in dealing with various governments and various financial institution can you please guide us sir how to take this vision 25 to the next level sir that, that's a very good question dr menon in fact i was happy that you use the term agile i think we should rewrite our dictionary to say a is for agile let the alphabet start with that and then we will get started on our journey sure. i'm delighted that you uh, talked about vision 2025 this is certainly something that uh, you should look at the reason that i kept my opening remarks small was that i thought perhaps there would be more use in a conversation with somebody as enlightened and you trying to respond to your questions perhaps i think i will be able to shed more light on what is specific to the requirements of uh, palakkad i thought that that would be more relevant than my talking about matters that are theoretical which perhaps are good pegs on which to hang an argument but will not travel much beyond that now i am delighted that there is a vision 2025 and i think again as i i go back to what i said the potential of palakkad i do not think has been fully exploited for years i think all that palakkad boasted in terms of tourism was the malabura dam and when tamil nadu had prohibition over the weekend a lot of people came from coimbatore to tamil nadu stayed there and then went back and that is all that uh, uh, we understood tourism meant people coming from across the border to uh, the malabura dam and going away even though there were hundreds of things that if we had perhaps the foresight and not say saying that everyone has foresight everyone should have perhaps there were missed opportunities at that time now when you talk in terms of and you are a health professional and i'm delighted i'm associated with the health industry in fact uh, as of this morning a digital health provider that i am associated with which is kolkata based has got the highest award of the united nations for for an intervention that is uh, non physical that is virtual that from the testing the consultation the prescription and the provision of medicine is a one stop shop okay. uh, and the united nations today this morning i got the news that it has been declared the best uh, in this particular context in which we are speaking today but okay. as someone interested in health care and i used to be for a couple of years the health secretary in a state where i'm happy to say that then there were 22 states in the indian union we were 22nd in the merit list at that time out of 22 states uh, i was given a responsibility as you said i have got uh, a lot of uh, jobs that nobody wanted so i was told can you fix this uh, i'm happy to report that i think at the end of uh, 28 months or so we were uh, one of the two states that got a special central assistance for uh, improved performance in healthcare in terms of both communicable diseases as well as hospital services but that said my concern has always been and you are the right person for me to raise this with i don't think india has given enough attention to preventive health given our population given the disparities in income given uh, the rural urban divide and every other divide that we have if we don't invest adequate thought and resources in preventive health care i think we are buying a problem bigger than we need to buy and i used to tell my friends in those days that 
you know, health for all by 2000 used to be a good slogan. Over time, we converted it to medicine for all by 2000. <laughs> we don't need medicine for all by 2000. We needed health for all. 20 years down the line, we are still talking about constructing All India Institute of Medical Sciences. These are referral hospitals in every state. We won't have the, uh, the uh, resources in terms of high quality manpower to man those and we'll call them aims and they will end up by something else. So I think on some things we are barking up the wrong tree. Healthcare, I think, and if in your vision document, some kind of primacy is given. If not primacy, at least significant treatment is given to preventive healthcare. Uh, earlier, we used to have school health programs, for example. Get that generation to actively participate in that be very useful. As for agriculture, again, I have a grouse with national planning in agriculture. You know, there was a minister who after his budget speech was told by somebody that you have not given attention to agriculture. I'm talking at the national level. And he said, I have seven paragraphs on agriculture in my budget speech. The problem is not part A of the budget speech, which is the text. The problem is part B, which is the numbers. What are the outlays that you have to match all the pronouncements that you made in the first part of your speech? That, that is a clearly important thing. So agriculture, I think, not just in Palakkad, but anywhere else, needs to move away from the excessive focus on crop husbandry and get to allied activities also. And there is a lot of scope for that in a state like Kerala. As far as crop husbandry itself is concerned, how do you ensure that the cropping intensity increases? Because the problem in Indian agriculture is that cropping intensity is poor. The farmers don't get enough. If the farmers don't get enough, uh, you procure what they make, keep it in godowns, don't see that it is used. There is a lot of uh, grain lying with the various godowns of the food corporation. And there are people that they need these grain in several parts of the country. Uh, it again is a failure of planning. So on agriculture, if the Vision 2025 document focuses on just two things, one is the allied activities, and the second is increasing the cropping intensity that you have, and therefore the productivity, I would personally be delighted to see that. I think this is an excellent effort. In 2020 is the time when we have the benefit of hindsight. Hindsight is always 2020. So look back, learn from our mistakes, and have a document that addresses what our potential is and, and build it from there. I think it's a great opportunity, and I must compliment the PMA for getting started on this. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, I need your input on the startup initiatives, especially how do you think it can fit into a place like Palgad? Startup activities are initiated all over India, whether it is uh, Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 cities. But uh, we want to have your impressions on the fate of such startups in a place like Palgad, or do you think anything special has to be done? Any special attention has to be given to a startup in Palgad? Because we have a lot of members in our club. We are all having a lot of initiatives. Their endeavors are on startup. So can you please advise on that, sir? I think for a startup, you need uh, to have an ecosystem that encourages startups. That is important. We as a country have been intolerant of failure. We must recognize that startups might fail. Every startup is not a surefire formula for success. And recognizing that you need people to make investments who will not make money in every investment. Typically, a venture capitalist does not make money on every investment. But if two out or three out of 10 succeed, he would be laughing all the way to the bank. He can live with the other failures because this would give him several multiples of what he brought in. So they, they understand the startup philosophy. The, the person, the entrepreneur who is going in for a startup 
must have one major ingredient. I quote a former Sri Lankan cricketer, uh, Arjuna Ranatunga. Of course, some of the other cricketers now are getting into the dock for match fixing. I'm not talking about them. <laughs> but when Australia won the World Cup, when, when uh, Sri Lanka won the World Cup beating Australia, uh, and uh, Arjuna Ranatunga was built on fairly generous lines, uh, like I certainly was, I'm still there. And the Australians made fun of him. How can such a fat fellow be a good cricketer? He can't, he doesn't look like he can even move. Correct. Arjuna made a statement which I think is a very, very good learning for the start. He said, it's not the size of your stomach that's important. It's the fire in your belly that's important. So a startup will succeed if there is fire in the belly. That fire in the belly, belly will extinguish all your initial doubts and difficulties. Is it worth for me? Because some people by nature cannot take those decisions. They look for the safety of jobs where there is a salary at the end of the month. Some people are risk takers. Now, the younger people are bigger risk takers. But you need to have belief in yourself. You certainly need to plan. Without planning, nothing ever happens. Simply having an idea will not automatically translate to a successful startup. Yes, or venture. You need to see how do I actually roll out that in terms of what I need by way of different resources, how do I get expertise, how do I compensate that expertise. One of the mistakes that startups make, because I am a student of governance and I go around the country talking about governance, one of the mistakes startups make is they say we have no time for governance and good processes, uh, we don't address conflict of interest, etc. Now, we will do it when we have grown to a certain stage, by the time your problems will multiply. You don't allow governance to run, run ahead of business, but it must run alongside business. If it runs ahead of business, also you'll fail. You will only be doing governance and not business. You need to do business also to succeed. So I think it is important to have an ecosystem. If you take Koramangala, for example, in Bangalore, every second house is somebody who's set up something. There are several people that fail there. Uh, typically, the environment is also useful. You need, you need to have people that hold your hand. You need mentoring initially. Certainly, you need a good idea. If you don't have a good idea because the marketplace is overcrowded. A me too product or a me too service will have limitations. It won't succeed. The other is government policy. Governments must consciously, uh, let us say, encourage this. And I will give you one example where governments get it wrong. You say that a director on the board of a startup, a new entity, cannot be given stocks because he's coming from the outside, he's an independent director. Now, you are not making profits. A startup is not going to see profits for several years. Therefore, there is no profit-linked commission that you can pay to that person. End of the day, he or she is a professional. To get their time, the service, unless you, somebody has reached a level when they're giving back to society without any other consideration in mind, you need to see how to compensate and they're willing to be paid in stocks because along with the entrepreneur, they also believe that this will succeed, which is why they're associating with this. But government laws, government taxes, for example, should ensure that a startup has a fair chance to survive. And the focus of the entrepreneur ought to be on how to grow the business rather than how to deal with government agencies. So I think you need a good ecosystem of which the government is a part, of which venture capitalists are part, of which successful people are part of which mentors are part. Uh, all of that, I think, will go into it. And then there are good uh, institutions that are financing this. A conventional bank will not give you money because traditionally a bank will lend to people who don't need money. A bank will never lend to people who need money. In fact, uh, when, when my son was going abroad as a student, I got a small book for him on 300 things that you should do to succeed in life. And one of the things said, if you go to a bank with an application for a loan, 
wear your best clothes because a banker will lend to you only if you seem like you're already prosperous. Otherwise, he won't lend. So your, your startups will draw blank when it comes to banks, but there are any other number of institutions that are venture funds, for example. If you are in the space of, let's say, doing social good, there are impact funds that help you. Uh, there are funds from within the country and outside. But the most important is that the entrepreneur must have a clear vision. He or she must buy into that vision. If you don't buy, if you have doubts, if you have concerns, if you have reservations, you cannot sell that to somebody else. True, true. And be able to absorb failure, be able to absorb setbacks, and then continue the fight to survive. That, I think, is essential for a start. Excellent. I really appreciate. I cannot ask anything better to you, sir. Uh, one more question prevailing in the mind of all the members of PMA. PMA consists of a, a heterogeneous group of people, of which a large number of people are MSME, medium, uh, small, and that kind of an enterprise. And uh, the... Uh, structure of the economy or the business structure or the volume of business they have, especially during this time and even every time, you know, they are at a great uh, stress. They cannot compete with the top giants. At the same time, they are uh, not uh, too small to operate in a less geographical area and confined. So this is a paradox. So what is your advice so far MSME during this time and how do they jump out of this uh, uh, this spasm? You know, the MSME sector is very critical for India. And anyone in the policy making space that does not recognize this is clearly not understanding how the Indian economy works, how the Indian economy works. Not just in terms of what it provides, but the employment, it provides the decentralized nature of its operations. Not that it is concentrated in one particular place, and the fact that the average person is able to create wealth and distribute wealth in his or her own area, that is what has sustained MSMEs in India for a long time. Many years ago, maybe about, and I will be absolutely candid, I don't believe in making politically correct statements. Many years ago, the government of India and its policy advisors who were educated abroad, had worked abroad and come and who, according to me, believed that the sun rises in the West and not in the East, because they thought everything that is good should come from the West. They came and influenced economic policy making in a manner in which two benefits that the MSME sector and the small scale industries had disappeared. One was price preference and the other was purchase preference. Both of these got knocked out. Because Western organizations, which had all manner of preferences in their own countries, prescribed something else for us and said, no, you shouldn't do this. That was a major setback for this entire sector. Then there were all other issues in terms of getting resources, in terms of the relevance of the products. If you're looking at an export market, anything that is low value, high volume was not an exportable product. You had issues of quality control in domestic markets, some of the things that you produced. And yet some of our best products came from these sectors. Then you had the problem of the big boys delaying payments to the vendors, the MSMEs, so that their cash flow got impacted. When the cash flow got impacted, it was easy to put pressure on them and do business with them. And while all of this was happening, the government turned a blind eye to this. They did pass some legislation which said that you should clear the dues of your vendors if they are small lenders, uh, so small vendors within a certain time. But all of that remained more on paper. And I think the last straw on the camel's back is what we believe is this great package that has been now given in the COVID situation, which has promised a lot for MSMEs. But in my conversations with some of them, as well as some of the APEX organizations of MSMEs, I hear that nothing much has moved post those announcements because 
the banks are to finance the banks will be guaranteed up to 20% by the government of india the banks will finance only those that are surviving many msmes have issues not of solvency but of liquidity if you address liquidity issues solvency will take care of itself after a while but if everybody is tarred with the same brush or oh, this account is getting irregular got irregular to distinguish between what is viable and what is profitable my business may be viable today and yet not making profits for some reasons which are contextual i can address those reasons and with help it will move from being viable and non profitable to viable and profitable but if that distinction is not made if very quickly this sector does not see the benefit of those announcements and even today there was an article in the newspaper saying notwithstanding all those announcements nothing much has moved in fact i wanted to ask this question that among your members those from the msme sector have they actually seen anything out of these announcements that have been made by uh, the government in the post covid in the covid situation whether anything really has come to the msmes is something that i would like to be enlightened about because this is a continuing conversation that i also have with my banker friends and one of the bankers put it very well i said if people are eligible why don't you give them this and he said eligibility is not entitlement if after i give this and it fails and some investigative agency comes to me and says why did you lend i am spending the rest of my life defending my decision so i don't want to get into that situation safety lies in not lending so you have a situation where bankers are risk averse according to bankers big corporates are risk averse they don't want to make investments till they know the till they have clarity on what the economy holds in the future if a big corporate does not want to make investments its resources are used for its own businesses you will not see much of it for settling the claims of the msmes so in a sense the msmes are getting the worst end of the deal and that will impact on not just msmes directly but on the employment and on the morale of non metropolitan india let me put it that way but but essentially they contribute to the wealth of the nation they yes. contribute to a heterogeneous product mix uh, in fact they contribute even to as you said the big boys the big boys depend upon these young boys that is <laughs> it is, it's yes. a paradox it's yes. a paradox yes. in spite of all that and in spite of knowing uh, that the truth that uh, something is not happening it's a real paradox uh, are you with me sir i am completely with you 200% with you everybody pays lip service to msmes everyone uh, echoes what you're saying now which is they provide they create wealth they provide employment and they do all of that uh, and without the msmes the big boys cannot survive they do need to realize that in the their own self interest they need to keep their ecosystem going which is an ecosystem of those that supply parts to them etc now i'll give you a simple example take the problems with electricity boards and the number of people who have set up businesses only to cater to electricity boards now given the health of the electricity boards all these people are suffering not for their own fault but because the electricity board is in bad shape in spite of three or four restructuring proposals and i am told another one is on the anvil now to restructure to what effect i do not know uh so the big boys also depend on it i think we need clear policy formulation and the covid times when this opportunity is available to us to think clearly to think of what needs to be done going tomorrow i am hoping that there will be a very serious attempt to implement all those major policy announcements that have been made without that you know i always tell people that you know when we have our breakfast in the morning we uh, use the grinder that we picked up from pilomero uh from a very small unit at that point of time they have grown they have grown now they are none of the big boys made the grinder which uh, provided me my, the 
ingredients for my breakfast in the morning. I picked it up from Tilamedu on my way to the airport at some point of time, many, many years ago. I was one of their first customers. So uh, I think we need to recognize that there are products that uh, can be created only in these places. They cannot be produced in the factories. The other point that I think is very critical, and this I think if you can uh, factor into the uh, 2025 vision document, is skill development. And this has been one of my concerns for a long, long time. We talk about our demographic dividend. We have a young population that is going to, uh, you know, make us a stronger country. All other countries have aging populations. Our youth are going to make us this, that, and the other. Uh, it's not the fault of the youth that we are not skilled them. If we don't skill them, they don't translate to a demographic dividend. Uh, skill development, in my view, needs far, far more focus than it has ever been given. That, that's another missing piece. I, I appreciate, appreciate. We have one question, the tail piece, the last question. Uh, everywhere we have seen any developed state, whether Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Delhi, Bombay and all, we find a lot of technology driven enterprise. Yes. Uh, so uh, what is your stand on, what is your point on this technology driven enterprise, high tech driven enterprise? Maybe I'm talking about Technopark, the set an ecosystem to develop a Technopark. Do you think that kind of an ecosystem will augment, will accelerate, will improve the velocity of industrial development in Palgat. What is your stand on this, sir? I think we needed Technoparks the day before yesterday. Oh, great. Not tomorrow. Okay. Not tomorrow. Okay. The, the problem was, you know, if you, if you recall, let us say, uh, 10, 15 years ago when you spoke about IT, it was really, uh, we were at the lower end of the spectrum. We were really doing the odd jobs for this. But the names that were mentioned were always Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu. Uh, south of the Vindhyas, the one piece that was missing was Kerala. Correct. It was much later that, you know, setting up technoparks, etc. got into the conversation. And I'm happy to see that uh, a lot of thought is being given to that now. Uh, because if you look at the Middle East or you look at the US, the number of people that have gone from Kerala and set up phenomenal ventures there. I see no reason why, given the opportunity, they cannot set up the ventures here. Problem also is that it's not easy to do business in India. At one time, somebody said that to set up a restaurant in Bombay, you needed 53 permissions. In the name of improving, in the name of uh, bettering the ease of doing business, they reduced it to 46. But you still need 46, 46. permissions to set up a restaurant. And the restaurant is not rocket science. You make some food and give it to people who will come there and eat. 46 permissions for that. If you don't simplify that, I had recommended to the government that you must encourage technology applications. You must incentivize technology applications. Any new unit that uses applications of technology in order to deliver will be the ones that will succeed going forward because you are going to find it difficult. I know people talk about jobless growth, but you can create if you have skill sets. There are self-employment opportunities. Everybody doesn't need a salary job in the government or in a factory. And you need actually to have better technology for products that will sell tomorrow and the day after. Uh, there are only some things that will sell without technology. A consumer sari will still sell without technology. A, a carpet from Mirzapur or from Kashmir will sell. Because uh, I don't know how many of your people know it, that if you and I buy a carpet in Kashmir, uh, we will not be able to make out the mistake in that. And yet, there will be a mistake that is deliberately left in that. They say that that is our signature on that. That mistake is our signature because only God can make 100% perfect and we should not compete with God. So we make that. Uh, the same way all handroom products, 
it is the unevenness of the product that is the thing. The, there are some things where power looms never could replace hand looms. They cause some damage, but they couldn't because there is a distinctiveness in that. But if you keep those aside, I think the mass consumption items must come out of technology driven applications. In fact, one of the problems in the COVID times was the, uh, you know, continuous process factories, which uh, were shut down by some people. So uh, saying that, no, you cannot uh, approach that, uh, those factories. So I think uh, Kerala needs, can do more, perhaps needs to do more uh, in this space to see that we put these to use. And young people are the best people to do it. Yes, fantastic. You know, I, I live in a neighboring state, Coimbatore, yes. where there is a classical example of industries growing. Visavis, the number of industries in Palgad, which is separated by 40, 45 kilometers. That's right. Yes. Uh, when I was, when I was uh, just uh, combing through your talk for the last few minutes, I understand the governance, I'm coming to your core area, yes. the governance of the given state the kind of inputs that comes from top down, it is more important than bottom up. Uh, is that you are subscribing to that, sir? Uh, I think you need both. Okay. I, I think you need a combination of clear policy framework laid down at the top and persons who not just respect the policy framework and act on it, but who influence policy formulation. See, the problem again, at times, and I'm not blaming anybody, is that there is a disconnect between policy and ground realities. You make policy sitting in the office without ground realities. I'll share something with you. Sure. One of the former secretaries to the government of India once mentioned to me that he had been to 23 states in the course of six months. I asked him a pointed question. So you landed in the airport went to the conference room and came back to the airport and flew back to Delhi. What did you see of the state? Because conference rooms in most state capitals are nearly the same. same some will same. be better, some will be worse, but they have nearly the same facilities. You cannot go to a conference room in a state capital and say I've been to that state. The problem is how much of understanding of ground realities is there for persons who are in policy formulation. Interestingly, our ministers have an understanding of ground realities, but their policy advisors at the central level don't have a direct understanding. And if you take them past an agricultural field, they will not be able to tell you what crop is growing there. Now, and then if you sit in Krishi Bhavan and make policies based on what the FAO tells you or somebody else tells you, there's a complete disconnect with what is happening in the ground. So top down is important, but bottom up is hugely important because mapping of availability of resources, skill sets, all of those need to be factored into the policy format. If someone asks a question as an individual, yes. if I have to uh, cross the chasm, yes. what, what all the steps I should take as an individual, a layman, Ordinary, simple layman. Put it in a simple language, sir. I would say work backwards. Imagine yourself across the chasm on the other side. Because one of the things that we don't utilize enough, and this I will say to the younger members of this meeting, is you do not utilize the power of visualization. I must visualize myself as having crossed the divide. Do I see myself standing on the other side? If that is a picture that I like to see, I have to work towards being the hero in that picture. That is a picture where it's not enough for me to write the script, but I have to act out that script. So I'm both the script writer as well as the actor in my own movie, which is the movie of crossing that particular divide. And okay. then I should not be caught by indecision. Much of the time what happens, whether it's in our personal lives or at the central level policy formulation, 
should we open up the economy or should we have lockdown so do you do a bit of this and a bit of this and you fall between two stools <laughs> the economy doesn't open up but the, the possibility of a community spread increases because you were undecided one day you said this is it one day you said that is it <clears throat> should workmen in delhi who want to go back to their home states from the factories in delhi or in bombay be allowed to go for two days you said no you'll use force to push them back on the third day you mobilize things to send them away if if there is no clarity and continuity and certainty in decision making uh, that decision making will finish off the entire thing so when you want to cross the chest you take the decision i want to cross the chest and there's no halfway house okay okay supposing i am coming running and i'm getting to the physical thing of that physical chasm which is there and i have to jump across it let's say it's not a huge chasm it is something that let's say the average person can jump if he or she comes running at high speed to the end and then has a doubt am i likely to go across or fall in the middle <laughs> no, no, no. you will fall in the middle you because you have generated enough momentum right, that you right. can't stop and you have paused and you can't cross you will fall in the middle sure, so sure. visualize where you are where you want to be then prepare what you need to do and give it your best shot sure sure nine times out of 10 you will get there uh, the 10th person that has attributed to bad luck maybe in the next life he will have true, uh, a better true. deal and talking about coimbatore hmm. the last 10 people that i spoke to who are shifting out of delhi and a lot of people are shifting out of here eight of them are going to coimbatore so it's going to be a crowded town before you know it <laughs> yes yes indeed indeed in fact we are getting message even people from chennai they right. are moving to coimbatore that's right yes and uh, there is a lobby working hmm. in chennai to oh. make people to move from chennai to coimbatore now it is because of covid ah. and even otherwise there was a plan to move ah. people from chennai to coimbatore mm -hmm. sir there is one question from the audience uh, yes. can i ask that question please sir. please go ahead the question is yes uh, impatient ah. and irreverence yes is considered to be not very well accepted by our society yes now how do i take it and move forward <laughs> it's a very very simple question excellent question excellent <laughs> question if any one person practices impatience and irreverence the rest of society will frown upon him correct correct if more and more people do it then people will see merit in it and go forward it is like failure you know india is a country which does not recognize that people can fail and failure attracts ridicule failure attracts at some stage even ostracism let's take business all businesses need not succeed some will become bankrupt for whatever reason good reasons maybe policy has changed may maybe something external to the business you are giving it your best shot and yet your business fails our society does not accept business failure the guy who is bankrupt we tend to in some sense look down on that person or oh, this fellow set up a business he failed the president of the united states has survived the present president i am no fan of his let me say that talking about the us system the present president has survived three banks of bankruptcy proceedings against his company and is still running business not only in the us but elsewhere through his benamis and is a president of the united <laughs> states that is because they recognize that there is no shame in failure so our society when i say that you must young people should practice uh, let us take impatience why is impatience important time is running out to make this the great country it can be you need people with an extraordinary amount of energy and enthusiasm now if that is not coupled with impatience and if they are very patient for governments to provide some inputs for somebody else to give something the energy and enthusiasm will get neutralized by the delay that is occasion therefore it is not an uncontrolled unbridled impatience i am talking about but moving away from acceptability i have always maintained don't focus on destiny focus on the destination 
you know, we all grew up thinking about destiny. What is written somewhere will happen. Now, I think we need to be the co-authors of that script. God is co-author, but we should also be co-authors. Let us look at the destination, forget the destiny. If we want to get somewhere, we will get there. And in that process, and I am thankful to whoever asked that question. Unfortunately, in a virtual conference, I cannot see his or her face. But let me thank the person through you for that question, because I think it's important to understand that if not yesterday, starting today, we must impatiently ask for things. And what do I mean by irreverence? I do not believe in the logic of hierarchy because I am senior to somebody in an organization. I may have the power and the, able, the ability to overrule his or her views, but that does not make me a superior human being. It only because I was born earlier, joined the organization earlier, I happen to be at a place where I am in the queue ahead of that person and therefore able to influence his or their decision. But his might be the better decision. How, how we encourage that, how we move away from a culture of psychophants. Many people say corruption is the big problem in India. I say it's equally big problem is psychophancy. Nobody says what he or she ought to say. And if you don't express yourself, the world will go by and you will be left behind. It is in that context I say that you must be impatient, you must be irreverent. We were very reverential to the earlier generation. I'll give you an example, my own example. If, if my father walked into a room where I was sitting on a chair, and I'm talking not when I was 20, but when I was 50 plus, if I was sitting on a chair and my father walked in, at least I would uncross my legs and move to the edge of the chair if I don't stand up. And I won't sit on his chair knowing that that is the one that he likes to sit on. My children, on the other hand, thump, thump me on my back and say, so how are you doing, old man? There has been a change. There has been a change in the uh, way. And is, is that disrespect? It's not. It's their way of communication. But it does not mean that they ought to be reverential. Reverential means I am buying into a logic that somebody older than me is necessary, wiser is not. Sir, uh, last, uh, I think I'm waiting for some questions from the participants. I'm yes, just... uh, I, I have a question, sir. Yeah, sir, please. Uh, now, yeah. yeah, sir, Sumesh Menon. Okay. So, so, uh, so uh, uh, probably due to the interest of time, probably we can take uh, one of these things. So my question is uh, this. So, uh, you know, as uh, uh, the situation demands and everybody is in a complete uh, standstill mode and uh, a lot of crisis is going on, especially on the company side. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the discussion around industry is next 15 years in India is going to be a complete game changer if we are going to take a right kind of decision because all the other external parameters seems to be in India's favor, especially on the China stuff and all. So in that particular front, how the SMEs or the MSMEs should equip ourselves on uh, making sure that we are not missing the bus or we are actually in that bus, whether is it an attitude, whether, you know, the kind of technology shift, what you have to do or, uh, uh, you know, something else uh, throw, so that you know, we can we can be relevant in the industry and we are in that bus uh, in the next 15, year, uh, 15 years. So, so uh, let me tell you, I am not from the area of technology. Uh, I don't think any of you know this. I, I was a student of IIT Madras and uh, dropped out. I was one of the earliest dropouts because I recognized that technology was not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So having stated that, let me say this, 59 apps of Chinese origin have been banned. Is there an opportunity for young India? A lot of people were using those apps. I'm not getting into anything else. Just look at those, the space vacated by those 59 apps. Is there something that bright young people can do? I know. Creating good apps doesn't need a ton of money. It needs good marketing. It needs good support. But creating the app itself doesn't take a lot of money, right? I'm only giving you one example. You said rightly that India will be far more significant in the world economy than it is at this point of time. If you roll back the years, many years ago, we were far more significant. Somewhere we lost our way. 
some way we lost our way for whatever reason. I think what we need to do is to look around us, see the way the other countries are battling. They're all in bad shape. They're all in bad shape. Now, if you look at Kerala, and I'm proud to say this, and I will say this here. Some of my friends in Delhi, in fact, compliment me, being of Kerala origin, for the manner in which Kerala has handled COVID, and Delhi has not been able to handle, and Bombay has not been able to handle. Of course, as I mentioned yesterday to some officers of the Kerala government, on their behalf, uh, I happily accept all the compliments being from Kerala. I said I will pass on all of that. But, you know, I think we need to see that within this space, what are the opportunities that are there? Identify those opportunities. Everything will not fly. I mean, every opportunity will not translate to a multi-million dollar rupee, whatever. But if you don't do it, if you say, I'll wait for COVID to go away and then start doing, sorry, you'll miss the bus. The bus would have moved on. This is the time to actually think on a, right on a clean slate. Okay, there is a world of opportunities. There is a world of problems that are staring us in the face here and now. In the midst of both these sets of factors, how do I chart my way to a better future for myself and devise better products and services? I believe that opportunity shouldn't be lost. We shouldn't lose hope. Uh, you know, many of us live in fear. There is an excellent line in English poetry, if hopes were dupes, fears may be liars. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you fear, what is it you fear the most? What you fear the most is fear itself. If you live in fear, uh, there's no way you can get anywhere. But if you believe that that is an imposter that I will put behind me, I have what it takes. I will also explain to you, I'm not a deeply religious man, but let me give you, let me give you a, an example I am fond of. Uh, Dr. Menon, if I may take a sure, minute. Sure, sure. sure. Okay. Oliver's, Oliver's. You see, God created several kinds of creatures. He created plants which have growth. He created animals which have growth and instinct. He created humankind which has growth, instinct and reason. So we are his highest creation, God's highest creation. Now, how does God know that he has done a good job by creating us? He has to set us some challenges to see whether we are good enough to meet the challenges. Therefore, God is setting us some challenges. But God is not uh, an unkind person or entity. I always believe kindness when people say God is kind, I say it's part of his job description. He is expected to be kind. Uh, he, he should not expect to be unkind. So if God creates problems, God also leaves solutions around. Younger members in the audience will relate to this, the game of treasure hunt. In a treasure hunt, you don't get to see the treasure immediately. You search for it. You get certain cues. But there is a treasure hidden somewhere. So every problem has a solution hidden somewhere. We must make the effort to find that solution. If we tell ourselves that, I say if you adopt the treasure hunt theory of life, that there is a solution for every problem and I'm going to find it, you will find more often than not and sooner rather than later, you will land upon that treasure. So keep at it. Don't give up. Giving up is what sets the losers apart from the winners. Really, you said, Great. sir. You, you have proved yourself again. You are a, uh, what is that called? Encourageable optimist. This is the way you started. You are describing about yourself. Incredible. And you have now proved at the end of the day. You, have proved yes. you, you are an encourageable, optimistic right person. I really appreciate. Is there any other questions? I think uh, due to the interest of time, if there is any question, I, we can take one uh, or else we can. Yes. Any questions, please uh, unmute yeah. yourself. and. Uh... Yeah. No question is a wrong question. Answer can be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Both wrong and wrong. Yes. yes. <laughs> so you need not worry about asking any question.
Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Nitin. I'm the yes. secretary of Palakkad Management Association. Great, great. Yeah, great to have you, sir. Uh, sir. So one thing, uh, because you are in governance and uh, how uh, uh, a system should work. I'm not uh, hearing you. Much... Hello. One second, sir. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Ah, right. Hello. Ah. Okay, go. Yeah. Uh, so, so I just wanted to uh, just check with you how an entrepreneur's will, like uh, whatever he desires, will be in line with the political will. Without that, I, I didn't hear the, I didn't hear your question. It, it just came because I have some internet issues. Can you repeat? Okay. Yeah, Can yeah, yeah. Repeat? yeah, yeah. So, uh, how much of an entrepreneur's will or desire? Uh, will go in line with a political will. Without that, how far can he go? With just his entrepreneur's will, how far can he go? Can he go without a proper political will? Can you can you put it in the chat box, uh, Mr. Nitin? Yeah, oh, I heard you. I I, I heard oh, it. Oh, right, right, right. How yeah. to go ahead without yeah. the yeah. political will? Yeah. I think we should not start with the assumption that there are a bunch of politicians who are uh, ganged up in order to prevent progress. Far from that. I would like to give them the benefit of the doubt and to believe that they too want progress. I mean, they gain nothing if there is no progress. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, the problem in life yeah. is that if you have an idea, you must yeah. find the champions who will take the ball and run. You must yeah. find the people that will support you, encourage you and do that. And mm -hmm. I think every idea succeeds not because it's a great idea alone, but mm. the fact that the greatness of the idea is adequately explained and communicated to people mm. that understand less than you do. Sometimes yeah. what happens if I have an idea mm. and I find it easy to understand because it is my idea, mm. I find it and I assume that everybody else finds it easy to understand and mm. then I run into a problem. I need to convince somebody. I say in life, all of us are salespeople. Yeah. It is just like the guy who comes, rings your doorbell and tries to sell you some consumer products. Yeah. If by looking at his or her face, mm. you don't see that the person actually mm. is, is believing in that product, why would you buy? <laughs> so you believe, you communicate that belief to others and mm. then you will discover that uh, uh, you will have more supporters than detractors. Thank so, you, sir. One question you, you. before we close. Sorry, uh, Mr. Sumesh. There is one question, very interesting question. Please. What is the role of HR during this time? Sir, how HR should behave? Because the, the, uh, everything is changing, right? The location is changing. Working hours are changing. Work from home. So the HR is really puzzled. How do I move forward in the ensuing days? What is my role now? Sir, your views on that. And with it this, is, we'll close. It is an extremely important question because on the boards of companies that I sit, this has been one major conversation. What do we do with people that work out of home? Because work out of home on the surface seems nice. You don't have to take transport to the office. It's easier to do flexi working hours, all of that. But there are huge setbacks. If you live in a, let's say in a, big city and live in a small room with your aged parents and if you have uh, children who cannot be easily controlled in the house who are making noise and then you are at your laptop trying to communicate there is a huge problem and people are going through some of that the second is mental health issues you need to have hr needs to ensure that people have access to counselors and mental health uh, practitioners because this is a new situation. Nobody has worked out of home for so long. People have been told that you can't go out. Think of the people who are in containment zones. They can't even step out of their house for a few hours. And yet they have to work. Then because they are working out of home, some managers will say, you are working out of home anyway. Why don't you work seven days a week? Luckily, there is no eighth day. You need to give that person the break that he or she would have got if they were working out of office. Yes, they will work late hours. Leave it to them. You want output. You want deliverables. But don't bring the rigidity of an office workplace 
and ruin the flexibility of uh, uh, doing this. Home. The uh, other issue that you need to look at is you are thinking of reinventing the organization. Now, there are, in good times, you did not address the flab in the organization. There were many people that were redundant, many roles that were redundant. Going forward, when you reinvent, when you shed some businesses, shrink some businesses, you will need less people. The process of identification can take place now, but don't give pink slips to people who are already hit by a crisis in the home situation. I know that people who have difficulties in the company, the cash situation is bad, there have been deferments, there have been some layoffs, there have been some uh, reductions in wage, uh, all of that because ultimately the company needs to run. So there will be some tough decisions. But do that by communicating with people. I would think HR's role was always important. It is certainly more important now than it was before because these are tough times. And HR is an institutional handholder for the workforce. If it doesn't do that now and functions like a policeman, then I'm sorry, you are not going to get uh, anything out. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we really earnestly appreciate your gesture. Thank you. Each, each, and, each and every points that you have pondered over the last few minutes, uh, it is something uh, even a hundred textbook cannot give in less than an hour's time. It's a condensed wisdom, a precipitated thought that has come from your journey of 50 plus years. Thank you very much, sir. We cannot ask anything better. I profusely thank the management of PMA for giving me an opportunity and all of us assembled together to share this platform. I am done for the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chandrasen, sir, for a wonderful uh, job. And uh, 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 may I request our secretary, on, uh, secretary uh, Nitin uh, CJ2, SJ2 to give the word of thanks, please. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, President, and uh, uh, thanks for giving an opportunity for uh, uh, offering a thanks to uh, one of the stalwarts uh, in management and governance. The profile uh, explains itself, and uh, we have been we have, we have been uh, honored to have you, sir, uh, and uh, and uh, heartfelt gratitude. Uh, on behalf of PMA for uh, giving your time uh, and uh, sharing your experience and wisdom, uh, which will definitely help us uh, move through or uh, think differently in this particular uh, scenario. So uh, a much uh, relevant topic and uh, brilliantly explained. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the session and the wisdom uh, and especially for your time. Uh, uh, a very special thanks to our member, Vinita, madam, uh, who have uh, tirelessly arranged uh, this particular occasion and make this, uh, made this uh, a reality. Uh, so, stalwarts like uh, uh, Damodaran sir won't, uh, you know, won't be available physically for an event. And uh, the, this particular scenario has given us that opportunity actually to uh, listen to all uh, stalwarts like this. Uh, in Zoom. And uh, uh, thanks to Vinita Madam for uh, arranging uh, uh, the speaker and uh, looking after all the coordination. Uh, special, to, special thanks to Sumesh. Uh, no, Chandrasekhar, Chandrasekhar, sir, you missed it. <laughs> Nitin. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going ahead. Uh, so, uh, uh, a huge, huge thanks to uh, the brilliant moderator, uh, sir. Uh, I have I have got the, personally an uh, an invite to uh, engage in one of the other panel discussions, and where he was the moderator, and I was amazed by the uh, the way he carries on the uh, session and uh, how uh, a directed thought uh, is provoked. So a brilliant job, sir, on that end. Uh, we have so much to learn from you, uh, being a moderator. Uh, and uh, that, that which made this a very engaging uh, discussion which uh, uh, put out a lot of inputs. And uh, again, uh, uh, thanks to uh, our president uh, for uh, choosing uh, such a uh, topic 
uh, we had a small discussion about this. <laughs> the uh, the topic was chosen uh, that way. Uh, so uh, that was a very quick and uh, <laughs> what is it? Uh, a very prompt uh, response. Uh, so thanks, a special thanks to uh, Somesh Chetan for that. Uh, and for all the arrangements uh, and for all the members who have uh, participated in this function, we have, uh, uh, it actually became a function. Uh, it was uh, the, I think 50 plus participants were there, which otherwise we couldn't, we, we would find it difficult to pull in. Uh, so thanks to all members who have uh, taken part and uh, given your valuable time for uh, participating in such an event. Uh, so let's look forward uh, for more associations, more uh, get-togethers, at least in Zoom, uh, and soon uh, in person. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nidin. Thank, thank you, you Damodar sir, Chandrasekhar sir. We'll thank keep you. in touch after the session. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Men. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure, sir. Thank you. My pleasure, sir. Thank you all.